Hello again. It's my pleasure and privilege to introduce and welcome our keynote speaker, Dr. Pedram Salimpur, current president of the Los Angeles County Medical Association. You can read some of Dr. Salimpur's accomplishments in your program. Some things doesn't say that. His father and older brother are both physicians. He taught himself English before he was 12 while still in Iran by watching cartoons. Those three awards for research, there are actually at least four, and he won them while still a medical student. He is the youngest president of LACMA. He has written more than 40 medical journals and produced an award-winning documentary, co-authored a pediatric diagnostic manual with his father and brother. He is adjunct professor at San Diego State University and associate professor at UC Riverside. Oh, that hospital in San Diego? It was in poor shape until he and his brother turned it around and made it a foremost hospital in the area. The 100,000 families his organization Next Care Collaborative serves, people who wouldn't have health, have health insurance at all. So there you have it. Prodigy, creative research genius, devoted to lifelong learning, successful manager, and caring physician. Kind of like what Western U represents except you don't have to be a prodigy. I am not only privileged to present Dr. Pedram Salampur, I am humbled, Dr. Salampur. That, that was unbelievable. Dr. Bond, you read it exactly as my mom wrote it. Thank you very much. I'd like to extend my gratitude to the entire Board of Trustees of this distinguished institution for the invitation to speak with you this morning. My good friend Brenda Primo, Dr. Connett, Provost Google Chuck, Dr. Beverly Goodry, Mr. Jeffrey Keating, of course Dean Crone, the deans of all of the schools, members of the faculty, families, President and Mrs. Pomerantz, and of course, the brand new students at Western University of Health Sciences, the colleges of medicine, pharmacy, nursing, podiatry, dental medicine, veterinary medicine, optometry, biomedical sciences, and the College of Allied Health Professionals. Welcome and congratulations. I name them all. I name them all because in my heart of hearts, I believe that you're all lucky to be in the distinguished company of your colleagues from the very beginning of your training. You may know nothing about each other now, but in four years or two years or three years at graduation, you'll be sitting here because of each other. Together, you're part of a new generation of clinicians, those who will find new ways to new places and new ways to bring the rest of us along. All of you, all of you, as was alluded to by Dr. Bond, were born with some gift. But talents are arbitrary. The choices you've made to get yourselves to this point, there was absolutely nothing arbitrary about those. Those were all you and the environment created by your families. So I know how all of you moms and dads must be feeling this morning because my own mom and dad are here this morning. And they're incredibly nervous, anxious even, because the last time they dropped me off at a place like this, it ended up costing them hundreds of thousands of dollars in tuitions and fees. So if you'll allow me just a moment of privacy with my dad. Dad, where are you? Raise your hand. I think we're cool. We got in free this time. As for the rest of you, as for the rest of you, by the time you graduate, you'll have more debt than Greece. <laughs> President Pomerantz, your work here over the course of the last four decades is the stuff of legends. As one of the most esteemed and revered figures in American higher education, I know that you're leaving office with an extraordinary legacy of achievement and success. And it's an honor for me to be in your company, sir. Still, after 38 years of accomplishment, I understand that leaving office, leaving the presidency, must be somewhat bittersweet. And I don't know if it's the Middle Eastern in me, but I can tell you there's nothing sweet about relinquishing power. If I were you, I would stay. <laughs> there are 14,000 different diseases, syndromes, and types of injury that have been described. 
almost 14,000 different ways that the human body can break down. You'll learn their definitions, epidemiology, etiology, pathophysiology, signs, symptoms, and treatments. The armamentarium that you'll learn about will include some 6,000 drugs and 4,000 medical and surgical procedures, each with different risks, side effects, and interactions. Almost no patient you see will have just one disease. Almost none of them will be on just one medication or undergoing just one procedure. The permutations are in the trillions and are incomprehensible. Add to this the precise sequence of actions you'll have to learn to perform each of these. And well, you begin to realize why thousands of very qualified candidates apply to medical school, nursing school, dental school, veterinary school, and the other schools represented here, and only very few get in. But it's not just for the reason that you think. I imagine that as President Pomerantz was on his initial flight from Chicago to Los Angeles some 38 years ago, he must have been struck by this inescapable reality, that there isn't a human being in this world that can manage all of this information and its exponential growth. Further, that along with checklists, it's only human beings that can mitigate the errors that other human beings can make in these highly complex, highly volatile, highly ambiguous real life scenarios of medicine. That the only way to create the best clinical outcomes for your patients is to create teams of teams. That's where you come in. And that's why this place is so unique. The fact that you've been selected through a process that's taken at least a year for each of you means that you can do this. All of us up here know it, I know it, but I think because I spouted off some crazy numbers, 14,000 diseases, 6,000 drugs, 4,000 procedures, trillions of permutations, I may have caused some anxiety. So I think it's my job to relieve some of that. And I'm gonna do that by telling you my story and the reason is that if there are any anxious parents here today, once you hear my story, you'll figure if that guy can make it, my kid for sure can make it, not a problem. And the second reason, and I think that one's the more important one to me, because it's an incredible feeling to stand in front of 5,000 people, half of whom are women, and just talk about yourself. So here it goes. After college, I moved right back into my parents' house. For most of you, don't even think about it, it's too late. But after a couple of months of going to the beach and working as a security guard for the Grateful Dead, and I mention that because I know you guys have a, an Oregon campus too. So after, after that, I decided to get serious. I'd known all along that I was interested in healthcare and started at the UCLA School of Public Health and then started work at an advertising agency in LA doing healthcare ads. Things were going well. Things were going well, but I remember thinking to myself that I really wanted to be a doctor. So I had a conversation with my sister and I told her, you know, I really want to be a doctor, but I'll be old by the time I finish. And she said, how old will you be in 10 years if you don't go to medical school? So what she was saying was, follow your dream. Problem was, I hadn't done the prerequisite work necessary to get in, but I sent a letter and my transcripts and I got a meeting with the Dean of Admissions at Boston University School of Medicine, um, Dean O'Connor, I'll never forget him. At the end of the conversation, he said, okay, you can take a semester of classes. If you do well, you can start medical school here. So in January, not September, I left and started medical school, or started classes in medical school in Boston. And, I, and I'm guessing, but I hadn't been admitted yet, and I'm guessing that most of you have been admitted, but I was like Vince Vaughn's character in The Wedding Crashers. I was dancing and singing and giving best man speeches, except I hadn't really been invited to the party. But I worked hard and things went well, so I continued on to second year and on from there. But while there, I came across a completely unanticipated opportunity. I had applied for a research job I never thought I could get, I wasn't qualified. But now, but I got an interview and I was then doing research on what would become one of the most important scientific, scientific discoveries in history. The product of the lab's work became known to the world as Viagra, and Viagra became the second biggest selling drug of all time. I see we have discriminating taste. And years later, Dr. Goldstein, who was the uh, a PI on the study, uh, I recruited him to San Diego 
to head up the very first Department of Sexual Medicine in the United States. So all my dreams seemed to be coming true, but I was in medical school giving, uh, traveling and giving speeches all around the world, but I missed my family and the path laid out by my father seemed to be calling me back. I left and I started a residency in pediatrics. The transition from the surgical subspecialty of sexual medicine to pediatrics wasn't easy. You're taking care of very sick kids and that's tough, especially when you're on call over 100 hours a week, you're stressed, you're hungry and exhausted. One night I remember a 15 year old girl came in who had attempted suicide. After we'd stabilized her, I went and I asked her why she had attempted to take her own life. And she said, because she was ugly. And that made me incredibly sad. But then she said, I should do the same thing, and for exactly the same reason. <laughs> and that made me even more sad, maybe even angry. Well, that's a bad example, because most of the time, and I don't know why I gave you that example, but most of the time, there's an incredible feeling when you take care of a sick child. And that has become everything that I thought it would and you will know that feeling. Since residency, I've worked hard, and there have been lots of detours there too, but none of them has been shattering either. So I've told you about some of my life's ups and downs and detours for a reason. And the reason is that because you've been admitted to such a unique academic institution, it's likely that your biggest obstacle is your own record of continuous success and the impression that successful people hop from triumph to victory. And that just isn't true. You'll have setbacks, but your setbacks are meaningful only in the sense that you'll grow because of them. The path of my life didn't turn out, turn out exactly as I thought it would. In some ways, it's been better. In some ways, worse. In most ways, just like you, I'm unfinished. Truth is, no one can promise you riches, fame, or eternal happiness, except for the founders of Tinder and Bumble. I think that they actually can promise you eternal happiness. And no one can promise you a life free of missteps, again, except for Tinder and Bumble. They seem pretty foolproof, actually. But I think looking back, that all of my big mistakes and all of my, big, all of my detours have been necessary. I left the predictable next steps of graduate school, I left a great job in LA, and I left the protected academic world of a surgical subspecialty in Boston. And after, e after each, the landing was turbulent, but after each, every fresh start was liberating, and today I'm as homesick for the tough times as I am for the good ones. So that's what I wish for all of you. I wish for all of you the bad as well as the good. Because when you look back years from now, your toughest days, and I promise you this, your toughest days will have been your best days. And let me tell you, you'll never look back and regret the things that you did do, except for maybe saving the life of a kid that's gonna turn around and tell you you're ugly. So what about all these years of classroom education that await you? I'll give you just one example from my own life. I memorized the Krebs cycle as a junior in biochem, then I memorized it again for the MCATs, then I memorized it again in medical school, then I memorized it again for step, of the, step one of the boards. Don't get me wrong, I'm glad I memorized the Krebs cycle half a dozen times, but let's just say it doesn't come up in my conversations with patients all that often. <laughs> Truth is, 50% of everything you're gonna learn here isn't exactly 100% useful. I know exactly which 50% and could tell you, but I wasn't given enough time, see me after. But what's most important is that you'll learn how to learn for the rest of your lives, and that simplest of lessons will for the next four years be pounded into every molecule in your bodies. You will find yourselves in difficult situations, and you will have moments when you won't know whether you'll be okay here. But whether you realize it in that moment or not, you will. You're our new generation of clinicians. You're the ones who will find new ways to new places and new ways to bring the rest of us along. And your experiences here with each other, with this vast cross-section of your colleagues from the very beginning of your training will soften the sharp edges of your grand ambitions. In this instant, life is being fired at you point blank. You're exploding onto the clinical world. Welcome. You're exactly who we've been waiting for. Thank you. Thank you.